The following is a presentation of Project Independence and WCWP. Project Independence is the Aging in Place initiative of the Town of North Hempstead. We provide programs and services designed to assist and support the older town residents who wish to remain in their homes as they age. If we don't currently provide a service, we will try and connect you to that service. Call 311 or 869-6311 to get more information or receive services. Welcome to Project Independence and you. Welcome to Senior Talk Radio here on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. This is Project Independence and You. I'm your host, John Ryan, and my co-host today is Otto Lose. Morning, Good morning, John. Otto. And we have a wonderful show today, and we have two special guests. But before we get to them, uh, I, I, and I usually don't read stuff. I want to read something this morning. And... Uh, this is from Margaret Mead, who is an anthropologist, and one of her students once asked her, you know, what is the definition of civilization? And they were looking for uh, the invention of fire or the wheel or whatever it is. And instead, Margaret Mead said that the first sign of civilization in any culture was a femur, that's your thigh bone, that had been broken and healed. Mead explained that in the animal kingdom, if you break your leg, you die. You cannot run from danger. You can't get to the river for water. You can't hunt for food. You actually become food so that other animals eat you. A broken femur that has been healed is evidence that someone has taken time to stay with that person, bound their wound, carried the person to safety, got them food, got them drink, etc. They saw them through the most difficult time. We are at our best, according to Margaret Mead, when we serve others. And actually this, actually Peter, my partner is the one who sent this to me, not knowing, planning for this show. But it is so true and it's so accurate. And today we have two guests on who are with hospice. Um, the Mary Ann Tully Hospice Inn, on Long Island, which is under Northwell. And with that, we have Jessica Dunn, who is the director of the social work for the hospice. And we have Kelly Tully. And Kelly Tully is the daughter, the youngest daughter of Mary Ann Tully, who the hospice is named after. And actually, Mary Ann Tully died 15 years ago, um, died much too soon. Um, but the legacy lives on with such a phenomenal hospice. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about hospice and we're going to talk about the Tully family and what they've done on Long Island. I'm going to start with Jessica. Good morning, Jessica. Good morning. Just, I would like to start with a general uh, definition of what hospice is. A lot of people don't know. Sure. Um, so, so hospice is a philosophy, right? It's a end of life philosophy about the way we're going to deliver care to a patient and what the goals of care really are. So a lot of people define hospice as a, a place. And sometimes it, it is in the um, example of the Marianne, you know, uh, Tully in it is. Um, but hospice in general is a philosophy about providing comfort care and quality of life care to people who have a, a life threatening illness, a terminal illness. Um, so hospice can be you know, for a year length of time, it can be for a couple of months, it can be for a couple of days, whatever the patient's goals and needs are. So really in hospice, we're, we're looking to um, manage symptoms to provide quality of life. We're not looking to cure anything. So we're looking to enhance someone's quality every day and to make sure that they have the death or the end of life experience that they wish to have. That it's really patient driven. It's so important for them to have peace. Just one second, Otto. Now I just want to introduce Kelly, um, and then we'll go to Otto. And from Kelly, what I'd like to know, just in a, a little conversation, and we're going to go back and forth, how did your family get involved in such a, a worthy, worthy endeavor, endeavor as the hospice? Well, my mom, um, I was a teenager, 13, 14 years old, and she had raised seven kids, and she wanted to do some volunteer work. And she ended up uh, volunteering as a caregiver for hospice. And um, I think it, it just grew f there from her. That's what my mom did. She got herself involved in something and she made it bigger and better. 
perfect. And then obviously after your mom died, but then we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, the Tully family then stepped up. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, uh, like, uh, as I mentioned offline, we're involved with hospice right now with a family member. Um, <clears throat> who decides that y you are now in hospice, uh, if you will? Uh, do I, as the patient, does the doctor, uh, who, who kind of gets the ball rolling that uh, you are in hospice? Like in some cases <coughs> that I've been involved with, the patient themselves really don't know they're in hospice. They've n never were told. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, how does it start? Sure. Uh, it can start a couple different ways. It can definitely, it's best start started by the patient's physician and a physician that they would have known for a period of time. Um, you know, that's the best case scenario. Uh, it can also be started by if a patient's in the, in the hospital and that's deemed by the case manager or the, or the palliative team or the doctor involved in the hospital care. Um, and the patient themselves can also, you know, start the referral process. But once a referral is placed to hospice, whether it's by the family, the patient themselves, a doctor, a case manager, then the patient and the family are definitely talked to about whether they want to elect hospice coverage. So it's supposed to be a patient's decision if they're able to make a decision for themselves to elect that because it is a benefit. It's a Medicare benefit. So the, the patient themselves, if they have the ability to make their own decisions, is the one that should be making that decision for themselves. But a doctor would have to certify that, that they would be hospice eligible. Unfortunately, I, sometimes patients probably are not uh, able to make that decision, and somebody has to make it for them, um, yes. which is one we're involved with. Um, you know, the patient just can't do it. They can't make the decision. But in my opinion there, Otto, if a person is not basically awake or they're in a coma and they can't make that decision, and, and Jessica, you can come in, I think hospice is less important. I think hospice is important for the person who knows they're dying, but is cognizant of the fact that they're dying. If you need a guardian to sign the paper, whether you're in the hospital or in hospice, it makes no difference. But if you know you're dying and you're on morphine, it's nice to have somebody come in, touch your hand, give you breakfast, and, and tell you what's going on in the outside world. That, that's how I look at hospice. Well, I think it's important for kind of everyone along the spectrum. There's a lot of patients who, you know, might be able to participate in conversation, might be aware of who they are and their immediate familiar surroundings, but they might not understand medical decisions or, you know, the full extent to what their disease process is. So for those patients, that might be someone where their healthcare proxy might make the decision for them. Um, you know, I think hospice is really important when, when people are, you know, very sick and maybe not able to respond very much because that's when families have a very difficult time sitting and waiting and caring for them. And that's where we find that we can really be supportive in, in telling them they might not be able to respond to you, but they can hear you. They might not be able to respond to you, but they can hold your hand. So we do the whole trajectory. You know, and if we can start out with a patient that can respond to us, can talk to us, can know who we are, then we can find out what their end of life goals are and help the family to feel good about how they're continuing to advocate for them and honor their wishes at the end of their life. Perfect. Um, I'm going to shoot back and forth because we have an organization like hospice, but also it has to be paid for. Um, and I know that the Tully family had their golf outing this year, but it was virtual. Mm -hmm. um, and still successful, Tully, uh, Tully, Kelly, excuse me. <laughs> uh, we didn't do anything this year, but we still raised a significant amount of money. We did nothing. Oh, I, I thought you did something. Okay. No, it was just we did nothing. A of you guys reaching out via letters or something or? Well, so it, 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 the process of planning the golf outing started and um, we were hoping to be able to do something, but um, in the end we couldn't because it wasn't, um, you know, people are paying for something, you want to give them a service, right? but it, it was almost easier not to give them a service than to offer them minimal. And, you know, we offered people refunds and they didn't want it back. They were willing to, you know, continue to support hospice another year without, you know, getting their golf round in. 
Right. But you see, something like that is also, I mean, it's not only what the hospice is providing, which is tremendous, but he, you, and your family, and your friends who you reached out for. And I believe the number was like $160,000, $170,000 for this year. Did we uh, raise um, over 200000 this year? Over two hundred, And nobody got anything for it. What they got was they know they were helping another human being. Right. And, and that's the best gift you can get that you set at night and said, guess what? I'm fortunate enough to write a check for 100, 500, 5,000, whatever. Um, and I don't need it, but maybe someday I will. Uh, and when I am in that need, I can call an organization that Jessica's involved in and say, what do I do next? I have to get my mom, I have to get my brother, you know, or somebody in there. It, it's tremendous that, uh, and I know there's other people involved in, and so I'm not just saying Kelly's family, but for this particular place, how it has come about, I, I think it's tremendous. Um, and it has to be stressed. Um, one other thing, and again, we have plenty of time, but, and we'll tell the story, we're going to have a break coming up, believe it or not, is you guys, and this goes to Jessica, have a very liberal, not crazy, but liberal visiting um, program, which is so important, knowing that a person's going to die, and I'm saying now because of the pandemic, I'm not mm -hmm. talking normally, in normal times, I don't know what the schedule is, but everybody shares it. Now it's terrible when you put a person into a hospice or a hospital and you may not see them again and you get a call a couple of weeks later. You guys have done, you know, with screens and plexiglass and everything. Just tell us about that. Sure. So, um, so one of, so I work at Hospice Care Network, which is the larger um, organization and the hospice, the Mary Ann Telly Hospice Inn is, is a program within that. Um, so at the Hospice Inn, pretty early on in the COVID uh, times. Um, our director there, Darren London, um, was very dedicated to trying to figure out a way that we could help to get some of these patients to us so their families could see them at end of life. Um, so we took our first COVID positive patient, I think pretty early on in the pandemic, um, and, you know, kind of went through with the staff to make sure they were comfortable and they were safe and the PPE guidelines were all understood. Um, you know, we, we were one of the first that allowed visitation. Um, and not only for the COVID patients, it was also a concern for the patients that were there for, you know, other illnesses, because people were still dying in the, in the middle, the height of the pandemic from other, you know, other illnesses. So it was important that they got visitation as well. Um, so we started doing, of course, limited visitation, two people at a time for two hours a day. Um, and then as, as things got safer, things opened up more. Um, so it's really a great kind of partnership between the staff and the families to educate them and make them feel comfortable, um, to do the proper PPE, to be safe at the bedside. If families weren't able to be there pre in, you know, present and they maybe they were sick themselves or they were at a distance, they couldn't travel to see their loved one as they were dying, then our staff, especially our social work staff would you know, facilitate FaceTime calls or Zoom meetings with family members so people could see people in different ways. And then this, um, that kind of visitation was opened up in that model in some of our other units, in some of the hospitals, in some of the nursing homes that if a patient was imminently dying, then they were allowed visitation. Do you, uh, get out of, go. Do you, do, uh, visitors is a, a subject that uh, everybody handles things differently. And there are some people who don't handle things like this too well. Do you try to prime a visitor before they come in, you know, on, on maybe how they ought to try to behave, even though it's difficult? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been there and I've seen people do some really crazy things uh, and it doesn't help the patient. So I was just wondering what, what the thinking was on that. So do you mean emotional reactions, things like that? Yeah, well, somebody comes in and, you know, I understand people will be upset because when you see people in hospice, typically they're not at the top of their game. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and some people can handle that and some people can't. And they mm -hmm. probably do more harm with their visit than they do good. Uh, and I was just wondering if there's ever any thought given to, sure. uh, you know, trying to kind of en uh, encourage people to... Um, try to control a little bit what they're doing when they're in there. So I think sometimes those reactions that you're speaking about happen when the education maybe isn't there. Um, you know, sometimes I think we 
misunderstand some of the practices we have at end of life. Um, someone mentioned morphine before. There's a lot of fear around morphine. Um, sometimes when we mention morphine to a family, they might get very upset. They might have a kind of adverse reaction. But the more we provide education and what the kind of intent is for something or the condition someone might be in, what's happening to their, bo what's happening to their body, that can really help people to cognitively understand that then can help their emotional reaction to things. So we try to do that um, to kind of more empower people with the information and in, inform them of what they're going to see. And then that should help with, you know, letting them be present with that person as opposed to getting caught up in their head, wondering what am I seeing? What's going on? How can this be happening? So we work really well as an interdisciplinary team at, of course, at the Mary Ellen Telly Hospice Inn and, and elsewhere in our network. Um, but we try to really work with the nurse and social worker together and the chaplain to really provide that interdisciplinary support. So the doctor or nurse can say, this is medically what's going on. You know, the social worker and chaplain can pick that up emotionally and spiritually and see how the family's processing that. You know, uh, that's a, I know, that was a great question. And Jessica, thank you. But at the same time, there comes a point where you can't control what people mm -hmm. do and say. And, and this is a true story. Uh, my father went to a wake years ago, and it was to it was a woman's wake, and he went up to the son and said, "Your mother, when she was alive, was never a good-looking woman, but they did a great job on her now." Oh boy! <laughs> I mean, you can't make this stuff up. No. And um, everybody in my family just cringed and said, oh, how would you say something like that? So, you know, I, I'm agreeing. You, you, you want the person to go in and be encouraging, but a person is still, they are who they are at the end of the day, unfortunately. Um, and when I'm talking about that, I actually want to go back now to Kelly um, in, in reference to... Um, a little further in reference to the support that the Tully family is giving. Um, and, and since you're the one that's on, I do want to give a shout out to your brothers and sisters. So you got to name them for me. I mean, I know their names, but that's besides the point. You want me to name my brothers and sisters? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Right. Well, Tommy's the oldest. Tommy, Joanne, Jimmy, Peter, Kenny, Alice, and me. Perfect. I'm no, I mean, because the other thing that's so nice about it is it, it's a family. Okay, yeah. so I mean, of the seven of you, it's not you and, and Peter or you and Kenny are deciding we should support this. No, it's a I, collective I, effort. Yes, it was a it, yes. As you know, after my mother passed, my my mother was on the board at hospice, and after she passed, my father took over her position. And when my father passed away, um, you know, we knew we were just going to continue supporting, you know, something that was so close to my mother and my father. Um, you know, I, I think we will continue to support for as long as we possibly can. Um, it's always been such a huge part of all of our lives. Uh, you know, since, like I said, since I was a young girl. Hospice. That's amazing. I had no, I didn't know that. And I know you and I know some of the story. I didn't know that. When did it become Mary Ann Tully? Uh, when, uh, when did the, they rename the inn? Yeah. Um, I'm going to say six years ago, seven years ago. Okay. It was renamed. Um, yeah, it, I, um, it was it, it. I think it was built when my mother. Um, maybe she was just. She had just passed because I know she was very involved in in opening it. But it, I think shortly after she had passed away. Okay. Um, but you know, my family's the, the golf outing itself to support hospice started in 1991. This year was the 29th year. Oh wow! And, yeah. And, um, you know, I think my mother started it so that she could raise money so that there was, you know, they could do more, um, uh, I guess, work and more, right. um, I'm trying to think of the name of, um, you know, they do so many things for children and so many, you know, that have lost their parents and, you know, things like that as well. So that th there was more um, funds to, to fund those programs. Okay. Okay. No, because I, 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 this one I really did read about, and there is so many auxiliary pro. I don't know what you're going to call it, but side programs um, that you know need be done. And the other thing too, and uh, I, I have been involved in somewhat with nursing homes and hospices and stuff with what I do. Um, 
but the Mary Ann Tully, it's, it's, it's almost decorated like a house. It's a very comforting environment. Yes. It's not yeah. sterile. No. And the people are unbelievably, unbelievable, you know, in the care that they give these people that are, you know, passing. Both my parents were on hospice when they died, but they were at home. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, I, I, again, my opinion, if I was on hospice, I want to go to the facility. You know, that's just my opinion. And I think I'd rather. Hmm? each his own. I know. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're friends. When the time comes, I'm going to call you. Like, get me in. Call Jessica. Get me in. Um, <laughs> Who makes that decision, by the way? Good you point. Know, I have no idea. Jessica? Well, that is a medical decision. Um, so hospice is a Medicare-based program, so we follow Medicare regulations. Um, that's also who the major pay source is for hospice is, is Medicare. So that's, uh, there's several levels of care within hospice and um, inpatient care, which is what the, the hospice in is, is one of those levels of care. So it's when a patient requires the kind of care that can't be provided at home, that's when it would be appropriate for them to be in something like the hospice in. Now that's either gonna be in the hospice or, or the same amount of treatment or well, not treatment, the same care would be offered to them, offered to them at home, excuse me. Yes, so most Am of I our right patients, there, Jessica? yes, okay. most of our patients, I'd say 95% of our patients are at home or what they determine to be their home. So that could be an assisted living or a nursing home um, or their home. And a lot of patients, you know, kind of might go back and forth. If they have a period of time where they're more symptomatic, they might go into the inn, let us kind of take care of them, make sure that their care can be managed at home and then go back home you know we that can work too um some families are very dedicated to wanting to try to keep their loved one home um especially now with visitation and everything like that right. um but you know some people are you know feel that they would like their loved one to die in facility so we do our best to try and get you know align that with people's goals if you right. have a, at home what are the hours typically uh, i guess it depends a lot on the condition of the patient but like what's the the deal like is it ever 24 7 eight hours four hours how, how does that work so it, so if you're talking about actual physical care like an aid well somebody or the yeah. hospice in general well and i guess that's really the question is if it's hospice care at home what does that mean does it mean you have somebody there all day eight hours you know whatever no, that's a great question because that's another kind of misnomer about hospice. So like I said, hospice is a philosophy and it's a, you know, it's a way of care. So what we provide 24 seven is access to our medical team, access to medications, um, things like that. So if there's any sort of symptom that comes up, if there's anything that um, I always think our best services, you know, that two o'clock in the morning kind of thought in the back of your head, that you're like, oh, should I take him to the ER? Should I take him somewhere? You know, that doesn't sound great. You pick up the phone, you call us, a nurse can come see you in the middle of the night. You know, I think that's the best aspect, the best service that we offer in hospice. So it's not 24 seven physical care, but it's access to care 24 seven. But there would be some physical care if required with AIDS? So the aid, the aid is usually there up to four hours a day. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the maximum Medicare allows. <laughs> The one thing that I like about this uh, is it just, it's love. At the end of the day, hospice is love. It, you know, people look at it like, oh, they're dying and stick them in the corner. That's not it. The definition of hospice is love. It's caring. And the reason I have both Jessica and Kelly on today is we have a family in the Tully family that has given millions of dollars worth of support to Jessica and the hospice organization so that they can provide the love to families all over Long Island. And that, that is, I mean, that's the end of it. That's really what it is. But just when we went into the break, uh, Otto and, and, and Jessica were talking in reference to the time allotted at home and, and just go further into that because you got four hours if you're at home, but of course, if you're in the hospice environment, you're there 24 seven. So anytime I want something, I can just yell for it. Yes, yes, theoretically. Um, so I think, you know, I just want to clarify that, you know, hospice, the whole program is meant to be medical support. Um, it's not, the intention isn't really what we call custodial care. So the, the physical care of someone um, 
you know, typically falls to the, the people that they live with, the people that take care of them, um, as they were doing before they were coming on hospice. So what we do is we try to add to that to make that a little bit easier for the family to relieve the caregiver a little bit, um, but the program isn't set up to completely support all the physical needs of someone 24-7. Um, what we are meant to do is to take care of the medical needs, to provide you know, that emotional support, that confidence, that training, that education to the caregivers at home so they can then provide the care or identify who they want to provide the care. So what we will do is partner with, usually it's, it's family members, it might be a private aide that they've had for many years, it might be a neighbor, um, the partner with whoever they identify, the patient identifies to be their trusted caregiver to make it work for them in the setting that they wish to be in. So we provide all different kinds of services, like I mentioned, the medical coverage, a nurse comes as needed at least once a week, but more if needed um, to you know, make sure that patient has all the medications they need, they have all the supplies, do any wound care if needed, educate on symptoms, tell people what to anticipate, what might be coming up, um, talk to the patient about their questions about their own you know, health needs. We, offer, we also offer the social worker and the chaplain, like I mentioned, to deal, you know, talk with them about emotional support needs, um, existential questions, spirituality. The social workers get very involved in the questions you were asking, Otto, about you know, how much aid service do you need? Do you need any more coverage? What other resources do you have? Can we talk about Medicaid? Can we talk about long-term health insurance? You know, is there, you know, and also having difficult conversations with families. Maybe there's a large family and all the care is falling to one person. The social worker will try and help, you know, everyone have that conversation about what's needed right now. Um, also, we offer volunteer support, which is how Kelly's mom got involved with, with hospice. And that's an amazing resource that we have, especially for those patients who are home most of the time by themselves, able to talk, able to converse, and really want quality of life. Our volunteers are amazing at giving them some extra quality, going, learning about them, looking at their pictures, sometimes watching movies, you know, teaching each other skills, playing cards, those kinds of things that, you know, maybe sometimes their caregivers don't have time to spend time with them like that. And our volunteer, you know, volunteers are amazing at doing that. Um, so we have a lot of resources to make people kind of feel the love 24 seven, even if there's not necessarily a, you know, a home health aid there 24 seven. Does it happen that it, uh, like we talk about an N and we talk about home, does it happen that you wind up with hospice care while in a hospital? Is that? You can, it depends on um, kind of the locations, but yeah, we, in a couple of the hospitals in the area, we have contracts or units on the, in the hospital um, where we can provide hospice care in, in a unit in a hospital if that's needed. And that would be similar coverage to the end like we were talking about. Right. Jessica, do you have, which I haven't said so far this morning, a phone number to give out? I mean, we were just talking about volunteers. So if somebody does want, not now, I know it's very difficult. So I'm sure you're not getting phone calls for somebody who wants to come and volunteer. Um, but a number they can put in their Rolodex um, <laughs> to call, because I see there's even a student program. Yeah, so the number is 516-832-7100. That's the main number for Hospice Care Network. So you can get to all of our sites within that one number. So that'd be the number for the Mary Ann Tully Hospice Inn. We'd use a lot of volunteers there as well. Um, and, you know, Nassau, Suffolk, Queens, that's what we cover. Um, so yeah, we're always looking for volunteers. And also if there's anyone that just wants a little more information about hospice, if they think, you know, you know, I'm okay, I had this diagnosis, but I'm okay right now, you know, but how would it help me? How would it benefit me? You can always call our referral department and, and see if it would benefit in any way. Right. Um, another thing, I, I assume just by calling that 83 Eight three two seventy one hundred number. I have a, a copy that Christina got me of a brochure um, that I'm sure people could just call for that brochure. It's a tremendous brochure covering all the various uh, stuff that goes on in hospice. Um, and one that I want to touch on actually now is pastoral care, um, mm -hmm. which is important um, because I mean, even just recently now in New York, we wound up with the governor and, and the church fighting. Um, uh, about freedom of religion, et cetera. Uh, but it's important um, that people have to feel that just because they're going into a hospice environment doesn't mean they're giving up anything from a, 
a, a personal perspective, from a religious perspective, from a dietary perspective, no matter what it is, a, everything is being done to accommodate them. Mm -hmm. Am I right there? Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, the pastoral care, I referenced them as chaplains earlier, so sorry for the okay, okay. terminology switch. Um, yeah, but pastoral care is a core discipline of hospice. And you know, every patient that comes on our program is assigned to a pastoral care counselor um, and have, has access to that. It's their choice whether they accept that or not. Um, but I think they definitely round out the support and, and help immensely making patients feel you know, comfortable and heard and witnessed at the end of their life. Um, you know, a lot of times questions like why me come up and, or why him, right? It might not be the patient asking themselves. We see sometimes the patients are the most comfortable with their own death. It's sometimes the family members, maybe the spouse that's been married for 70 years and now her husband's dying. And she's saying, why him? Why can't it be someone else? Why him? And we can talk about that emotionally, but sometimes it really is a spiritual question. That, that you know, kind of exis existential aspect of death really can be processed very well with the pastoral care counselor. Right, now that part of it's important. Journaling, different things like that, that people, um, you know, at a certain point in their life should focus on to mm -hmm. get in touch with, it's very stoic in nature, but you know, life does end. I mean, nobody's here mm -hmm. forever and, and mm -hmm. we all have to put that in perspective. Um, actually, I wanna go back to Kelly um, I know the golf ornament, ornament, not a tournament, excuse me, not ornament. I'm getting ready for Christmas. Uh, the golf tournament is your big thing. How did it come about? I mean, that's just because a golf tournament or your family are major golfers or. Yeah, we're a big family of golfers. Um, you know, always have been. My parents both were big golfers and, um, my mother started it at her golf club. And then oh, your it, mother started it. I had no idea. Oh, okay. Yeah. My mother started the, um, the, uh, you know, the, the outing itself, I can remember it, you know, I, I was young and I can remember it and it just developed over time. And then, um, it became like a, like a sought after thing after a while, everyone wanted to play, you know, in the, the golf outing and it became, you know, a, a lot of the, the people that have supported us are the people that support, you know, my brother's businesses as well. So that's right. Um, right. Well, that, that usually, you know, when you to have a successful golf outing, you know, you have to have an honoree um, and you have to have the people doing it have connections. I mean, it really, it works. There's no question about it. Yeah. So that I, in order to do business with your family, say, guess how am I going to do it? Let me take care of the right. hospice. And then hopefully you'll turn around and say, well, he's, everything is equal. He's a good guy. And at the same time, he, he helps the family hospice. Yes. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's just like I said, it's progressed over the years. Um, you know, it, it was got really big for a while and then we kind of wanted it to be, you know, a little bit more sought after so that we could raise more money, you know, by, by increasing the, um, the foursomes and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, we've done really well over the years with our hundred and I think we're up to 110 golfers and, wow. um, it's, it's been very successful and uh, very sought after golf outing every year. Next year, I'm going to be involved in the golf outing. I'm going to be a driver for a cart, though. I don't, I don't play golf. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to drive one of the carts. And actually, since we are talking golf, um, and I'm sure Keegan's in school today, uh, Kelly's youngest yeah. son, Keegan, is like the champion golfer in their golf club. And he's, yeah. six, he's 16 or 17. 16. 16 years old and I saw his picture during the summer at some point yeah uh, he and it was a ridiculous number like 60 something or 70 something I think he whatever was, a good golf he had a number 72 was. that day or something yeah but nevertheless he was the number one golfer in their their club um and also in his school doesn't he play with the school he does play for the school but last year they didn't play because of the pandemic so we don't really know oh. where he stands at school that's true too <laughs> but, no, no, but at the same time I mean, I'm not, a I'm not a champion golfer, but I played yesterday after the frost delay. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> oh, yeah. We play all year yesterday. round. No snow on the ground, and we play. <laughs> That's a, and Arano's also We actually have golfer. used a hammer and a nail to get the tee in the ground. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. We have a name for our group, which I won't use on this show. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you, it's you can tell us at the next break. The initials. <laughs> the what? Uh, what is it? 
C O B. Crazy okay. old. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? So long as you're out there having fun, that's the other side of it. I mean, before we anybody have a winds good up, time. I lost the dollar. Too. <laughs> John, I do want to say one thing. When my mother um, was, put herself on hospice before her okay. passing, she put herself on yeah. hospice in July, and she passed in September. You know, she knew what she was getting into because she had been so involved with every um, aspect of hospice. But the people. And your mother was came, a nurse, too, right? My mother was a nurse, yep. Yeah. That was, you know, by trade, she was a nurse. Before and she, she was, was a model. I've seen pictures of yeah. Kelly's mom going back. She was on magazine covers. She's gorgeous. But she anyway. was on the cover of Look magazine. <laughs> but so I just want to say that the, the people that come in from hospice are amazing. I can't say enough about them. She had this aide that would come in and sing to her and just be. I mean, such a, such a presence in, it, they would come for, you know, a couple of hours, like Jessica said, and it was just absolutely incredible and amazing. And the people that do this work is, I, I, it's, I, how hard is it to be with somebody who, uh, you know, they're, they're dying and you don't know when they're going to die, but you come in every day with a, with a smile on your face and they're just as happy to see you as they, as you are them. You know, it's, it's very. Ex Do we want to go further, Kelly? I mean, it just, it's an incredible experience. Um, and, you know, the people that come in and like I said, they're just, they're come in with a smile on their face every day. And it, it truly is for the families and, and the person that, um, you know, is in the hospice itself is, it, it's amazing. And, and I've experienced it both at the inn and at home with both my parents. Um, so I've, I've had a little bit of both. It's very nice. And I can tell you, I made calls I get from, or emails from people who have been at the end as well. And um, just thanking me and my family, you know, for being such a huge part of, of uh, hospice. That's beautiful. And it's very important. Um, I, I actually, maybe it was 10 years ago, I went through a program at the Landsberg Hospice, which is part of Parker Jewish. Um, and I, I trained to be a volunteer and I did it for a while, to be honest with you. And then I, I, I do so many different things. You run out of time. But I used to go to people's houses and keep the person company whose spouse was in the hospice uh, and just, you know, maybe wow. go shopping or something just, you know, for that downtime when they went home and they had nobody with them and the wife or the husband was in hospice or even hospice in the room next door. There was one situation where it was at home hospice, but the poor woman didn't know what was going on. And he just sits there for the day. So, you know, you go in, you give him a break, you talk about stuff. I don't know anything about sports, but this particular guy was a sports nut. Uh, and I'm like, oh God, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, but you just go, yes, it's company. At the end of the day, it's company. Um, did I want coffee? Did I want tea? And they're so appreciative. And that's like an organization like the Mary Ann Tully Hospice Inn and all everything that's involved in the network, the hospice care network. It's so important for people who don't, you know, you don't realize it. You, you just said it, Kelly, people are giving you thank yous yes, because yeah. you never appreciate it until you go through it. It's very uh, true. You know, my mom died. My mother was born on St. Patrick's Day and she died on St. Patrick's Day and she died five years ago. And coincidentally, you know, she just had went in for gallbladder surgery, never came out. She died in five days. My sister and my two brothers, my wife, two of my girls, one was away. Everybody was with her when she died because we got a phone call and, you know, there was 20 people around her, which is, you know, you're not always going to get that. Um, but she knew we were there. And that's, I think, such an important thing with hospice that even, and this is my belief, even if the person is unconscious, I think the spirit and the soul know that there's people around who, as you said, Kelly, are singing. Absolutely. I hear the song. Mm -hmm. You may not think I do. Sing to me anyway. Um, yeah. You have nothing to lose. You, you agree, Jessica? 100%, yes. I, and I think that's, you know, what keeps people going in the difficult work that we do. Um, you know, people are definitely inclined to work in hospice. You can tell like, you know, the people that when, when someone starts working, you know, with us, you can kind of see right away whether they're going to be a lifelong hospice person or if this is going to be a, just kind of a dip in their career. Um, 
because that revitalizes us when we have a patient or a family that, you know, their goal is to be together around that person, wherever they might be at the end of their life, providing them comfort, providing them care, and we're going to help them do that. So even though it, on the, from the outset, it looks like a very sad situation, there's so much love, there's so much hope, there's so much joy. Um, you know, I feel very lucky to get to meet people that have lived amazing lives at the end of their life and look at their pictures and hear their stories and give them that little bit of value and give them that meaning at that, such a difficult time. So it's going to happen anyway. We might as well help to bolster it and make it a little bit better. Um, so that is how I think all of our staff view their jobs, that, that we're honored to, to be given that opportunity to be with someone at that vulnerable moment and honored to and thankful to the families to partner with us to do that because mm -hmm. we can't do it on our own. If we don't have a family, like Kelly was describing, that accepts us, that listens to us, that converses with us, you know, we can't provide as good of a care. And, you know, especially the, the kind of support you know, Kelly's family gives us, you know, financially through their fundraising and, and the amazing things they do, we're able to really provide complete care for patients. So we try to pride ourselves on not saying no. Like I said, we're a Medicare funded program. So that doesn't always encompass everything somebody needs, but having that wiggle room with, with the fundraising and the support really makes it possible for us to really get people what they need. And that's so... I don't go ahead. I'm sorry. No, just like you, John, my, my mother died in 2003 and uh, I've had a number of personal experiences with hospice, all positive, but I remember my mother, at, at, we didn't know about the uh, Tully or the hospice inn at Margaret Teets nursing in, in Jamaica. And my mother wound up in there. And I remember when my mother went in and I looked at pictures of the, of the, of the Tully inn and it reminded me of it. She went in and I could just see a deep sigh of relief when she got into this room. It was like being in a Marriott hotel and she looked out and there were flowers and, you know, my, I could just see my mother was really at peace now. And at that point she was 91, 92 years old. And uh, it felt good for me, frankly, to see her in that state, if you will, you know, even though she was going to die, but the people around her were so committed and so dedicated and, and the difficulty I would think in your world to get people to do that, you know, not everybody has that uh, gift, if you will. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, if people are inclined to go that way, boy, do it. Because I think you are, you're uh, giving to the world a great gift if you, if you help people through these difficult times. Like John said earlier, doing for others, Boy, there's nothing more th than helping others when they're when they're dying, you know, if you will. Uh, it, you know, it's not always an easy time. Some people can handle it, and some can't. Um, so, anyhow, that's my speech. <laughs> well, no, I appreciate that, Otto. And the other thing which I want to say, just and we have a few more minutes left. Otto is one of those people we have on this program. I I call it. You have to own what you do. And Jessica, you just said it. I don't want the person that's getting paid and they went to a different job because they got another $5,000 raise. No, I want you to be there because you love hospice or you love being a cook. I don't really care what it is. And, and Otto had said it years ago. And Otto is really, he's a member of Project Independence and, and he's just an extraordinary human being. And I love him. And he talked about his dad once. And his father was a milkman a professional milkman makes no difference what you are do it from a professional opinion do it from the point of view that you love your job you shouldn't be a hospice person volunteer just to get some credit on 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 a resume you have to go in there and open your heart and soul to whoever it is is in that bed and try to give them whatever piece you're not going to make them healthy there's no question about it we know that and at the same time we're all going to die eventually anyway but just have the road to death somewhat nicer. That's all I'm saying. And, and I'm going to go back to Kelly and then we're going to go to Jess. But from, from Kelly's point of view, and I really, I want to congratulate you and your family. I mean, uh, we're not ending this now. We don't even, but the amount of work you do um, and your brothers and your sisters, you can come up with something else. You, you know, you have the ability to raise money, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. You can give it to anybody. The yeah. fact that you're maintaining this for your mom is just, it's, it's phenomenal. We, I, I'm just going to go back one thing. And, uh, and here we call them hospice angels. 
I know uh, there, there really truly are angels, the, the people that come in, the, the nurses and, and the uh, caregivers, the volunteer caregivers, they're, they're, they're angels. But, um, you know, I think as for us, we want to continue my mother's legacy through hospice. Um, she was a huge integral part in um, building hospice to what it was or is, um, you know, when she passed and it's continued to grow immensely since then. So, you know, I, my family and I will definitely continue to, um, you know, support hospice any way we can. You know, I, I, I know my sister-in-law does the, um, the gala. She's been chair of the gala a couple of times. So it's been, uh, you know. Oh, I forgot about the gala. Right, right, right. I know you did the gala too. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I know you've gone to the gala. Yes. Yeah. We've gone to the gala many years. <laughs> right, right. But you know, you have to, you have to do what you can yes, at the end absolutely. of the day. And then you have someone like Jessica who is running the show. You know, honestly, it's the truth. I mean, this, this is a perfect match because you need somebody like the Kelly family, the Kelly family, the Tully family, um, who's out there trying to support it with love mm -hmm. and money. And then you have Jessica with love and skill, mm -hmm. trying to get the best possible care for the people who are utilizing hospice. Um, cause it, and, and that's got to be rough because... You, you, you want to open your heart, but you realize it's going to get hurt every day because mm -hmm. tomorrow I'm going to walk in and see that Susie is no longer here. Mm -hmm. She died during the night or Eddie's not going to be there, whatever. And it's heartbreaking, but you still have to give it your all every day. Right, Jess? Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, the way we look at it is if we can make it better for the patient and the family, if we can make it so they can be present, feel their emotions, go through it together. And we know then the people that survive this death are going to be better off and live richer lives and have better relationships with their family, then it's all worth it for us. You know, that's, that's really what we strive to do. It's not about us. It's about the patient and the family. So it might make us a little sad. We are human. Um, and we do this job from our heart, but we also have to be maintaining that outlook that it's for the patient and for the family. And I want to just mention that, you know, yes, Kelly's family immensely fundraises for us. And that's amazing, but also the, awareness and the word that they spread about hospice is so important too because that's something we're always trying to and that they i thank you so much for having me on today because i think there's a large group of people that could really be benefiting from our services that maybe are scared of the terminology scared of the word hospice and i think the fact that kelly's family is getting the word out to so many people with their golf outing with the people they know by their support of the gala and everything they're trusted people in the community and they're you know really letting people know what the service is and not to be scared of it. That's such a huge help. And I thank you, John, for, for contributing to that today too, because I think people need to know that we're here for them, not just in the last couple hours. Yeah. Right. I'm agreeing a hundred percent. Again, the number uh, for Jessica is 516-832-7100. And that's for anything. So even if you want to get involved next year in the golf outing, or you want to go to the gallery, you want to go to anything, uh, you just call the number and whoever's answering the phone will get you in touch. Uh, you know, right now with the pandemic, it's terrible. And we're going to be this way until June. Uh, that's my guess. I have no idea. Uh, vaccine will roll out, et cetera, et cetera. I, I have uh, uh, one person yesterday who I was told died from COVID who uh, I went to actually grammar school with. And, uh, and another friend of mine is in the hospital. Um, and that's just in, in two days. Um, that it's just, you know, I, I sent something out to a couple of clients the other day. We have on a daily basis as many people dying who died in the World Trade Center bombing, 9-11. Um, we were over 3,000 3, a day almost. That was such a big deal, and it was. And we have that number dying on an annual basis. But anyway, um, yeah, I want to thank you both very, very much. We're basically out of time. I told you, this flies. The hour goes so fast. I will have you both back again because this is just so much information. You're two wonderful, wonderful women. Jessica, I want to thank you for all the work you do, your hands-on work with the people. And, and Kelly, all the work that you and your family do to get the money together to keep Jessica going. I want to thank you all very, very much. Have a wonderful weekend. You've been listening to Senior Talk Radio here on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org.